the reality is this may be true. There may be just some giant alignment issue happening at OpenAI. Everybody's leaving. You know, Sam is really uh, a bull in a china shop, etc. This may all be true. Anthropic, say what you will about the narrative, as you said. They're using the narrative and they're collecting tokens and they're investing in this stuff and they're winning the story. You're listening to the Startup Podcast. This is a Reacts episode. Industry insiders having frank debates about the latest tech, politics, and business news. Whether you're a founder, investor, or operator in a startup, you'll gain insights into how current events connect to broader themes and trends that impact your startup, your investments, and your day-to-day operational decisions. The conversation starts now. Hello, I'm Amir Shvat. And I'm Chris Saad. And on today's show, we're going to discuss OpenAI, specifically their new feature for structured outputs in the API, and more execs leaving. Oh my goodness, what is going on there? It's an exodus. We're also going to talk about crypto and tech stock. They've gone through a huge correction, a massive decline. Is this a a huge downturn, the beginning of the end, or is this just a blip on the radar? And then finally, we're going to talk about a judge declaring that Google is a monopoly in search. How does this antitrust ruling affect startups, founders, investors, and Google moving forward? Will it cripple their ability to innovate or will it create a whole Cambrian explosion of innovation from everybody else in the ecosystem? All that and much more on this week's show. Stay tuned. Whether you're starting or scaling your company's security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance with SOC 2, ISO 27001, and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. And it gets even better. Just for TSP listeners, you can get $1,000 off Vanta when you go to vanta.com. Dot com slash TSP. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash TSP for the Startup Podcast to get $1,000 off. All right, before we get into today's show, just a little bit of housekeeping. The first thing to know is Yanev is on a protracted break. He's going to be away for about three or four months. I know, I know it sucks, but I'll be here. We'll have a lot of great guest hosts. And we've recorded a lot of episodes before he left, so you'll still hear his voice over on the EDU episodes week in and week out. And the other thing I want to talk about is the Startup Podcast Pact, which is an implicit pact you've signed if you've heard a few of our episodes and gotten value. We just ask that you subscribe to us in your favorite podcasting app, give us a review, and subscribe to us on YouTube. It helps us juice the algorithm, increase our distribution, and ultimately help more founders like you. All right, with that, on with the show. Let's jump straight into topic number one, which is really topic one part A around open AI. We want to talk about their structured outputs announcement. And then one B is some executives leaving again uh, and, and why that might be happening. So let's first talk about the good news for open AI, the structured outputs addition to their API. Yes. Now, Amir, you and I, we're, we're API guys. You ran the developer platform for Slack and for Twitter. I ran the developer platform for Uber. There's nothing more than we like, than a, nothing more we like than an API. Yes. And OpenAI has been steadfast and steady in their continuous iteration of their API. Uh, I think they really thought of themselves as an API company first until the chat GPT moment. And they just keep adding more and more what I would call developer lifestyle improvements to that API. But, you know, some of these are flirting with really like core utility, you know, how to make this really useful in a production system, how to make it deterministic, how to make it measurable, scalable, you know, make the billing easier and so on. And their most recent change is to introduce something they call structured outputs in the API. This is essentially just for those who aren't API aficionados and nerds like us. An API is a way to query another system and get some structured information back. If web URLs, where you kind of browse the web, are designed to return human readable web pages back to you, APIs, you hit those URLs and they return structured data back for other machines to read and act on. The UI is the, the web and the API is for machines talking to machines. And this is, this is of course how all of these wonderful applications, AI applications in particular, are getting built on top of ChatGPT. One of the things you need from a good API is structure. Structure meaning like, hey, this little piece of text is about this and this little piece of text is about this and this little piece of text is about this. And the structure is often encapsulated in something called JSON. 
So, you know, web pages are encapsulated in something called HTML and APIs are typically encapsulated in something called JSON. OpenAI here has added structured JSON responses to their API, which allow you to actually choose your schema, to choose the way the structure is laid out so that your app can kind of define the structure and have more control over what comes back from the API with no hallucinations and, and no missteps. Just makes it easier for developers to, to use the thing and to, to be confident in what they're going to get back and to be able to parse that and build applications on top. I think this one is really, really important because if you talk to developers that are using OpenAI, the first thing they'll tell you is that it's not predictable. You ask it the same answer and you try to give it a format. Tell me in the format of a yes, no, or pick a number, or pick a color, or pick between two options. It's really hard for us to control what the AI will answer. They say that seven out of 10 times it answers amazingly well, but in the three times that it doesn't, it's really hard to program around that. So if you're wanting to build a predictable, easy to use system over open AI, it has been hard and is still hard. So structured output is a step into solving that. It tells the system, hey, when I ask you for something, this is the structure of the answer that I want to get back, right? And that's super useful if you want to programmatically and repeatedly build a business on top of OpenAI. When you talk to ChatGPT, you don't mind if it's giving you a shitty answer once every seven questions. But if you're programming, if you're building mission critical systems on top of that, that is critical. That's why I think this solution is great. By the way, when I talk to developers today about this, they actually had a downside, which is they said that a lot of them are using multiple AIs to, mm -hmm. to program. And they kind of were sad that this is a specific open AI solution. And what I've heard from them is like, there should be a standard, like you mentioned, like HTTP or HTML or all the other standard, there should be a standard of how do we program with AI and all the providers should adhere to things like structured outputs. So to put a very fine point on that example you just gave, if a human being gets, you know, three out of 10 responses in a weird janky way, we're very adaptable. We're like, yeah, no worries. I'll just try ask again, or, or I can read around that weirdness. If a computer gets a weird response three out of 10 times, well, that means the engineer has to spend a lot of time anticipating those three out of 10 times. Yep. And so that blows up their work. It blows up their scope. It blows up the, the effort it takes because those three out of t 10 times will just break your software otherwise. I've had personal experience with this where I've built a little fun little side project called Wingman and we've you know used a bunch of prompt engineering and we've had to just go to enormous efforts in the prompt to go like, do not respond with HTML, only respond with markdown, you know, do not include line breaks. And like, it'll just sometimes ignore us and the, the output will look like shit. And um, so we spent just an inordinate amount of time trying to get the, the response to, to be great. I had the same thing. I, I wrote something called cat GPT, which is a, <laughs> a, a cat, a social cat account. And I told it specifically not to put certain characters in it because it broke my code. And once every 10 times, it actually put all these characters in it and did bold with a B and stuff like that. So for me, it was very hard and I had to like anticipate something that was uncomfortable to do. And this actually solves that. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, you mentioned this question of standards and it's, you know, that it's suboptimal for each different AI company to implement this in a slightly different way. Again, you and I, I think, are both are very hot and heavy on open standards, very much trying to build an interoperable web, an interoperable, you know, mesh on the internet. You know, I popularized this term data portability as part of the data portability project. We had a, a you know, a really big effort about this uh, some years ago. Uh, it's now part of the GDPR law in Europe and so on. And so this is very important to me and near and dear to my heart. But in developing this conversation, in participating in this conversation, in moving it forward in my small way, I came to realize that there are real limitations in major companies adopting open standards, just as a matter of their incentives, their business models, and their, their need to be able to iterate in an agile way. And so the winners rarely adopt standards, partly because it's not in their interest, because it dilutes their moat but partly because they want to keep innovating and iterating ahead of the curve. 
And so if they have to conform to a standard, there's a lot of bureaucracy and constraints that minimizes or mitigates their ability to change their mind and to, to do new breakthrough things. And so this is analogous to like Europe, which is, and again, it's interesting how cultural contexts work, right? I, I come from Australia and I came to Silicon Valley with these ideas of a very egalitarian web, a very interoperable web. But it, it turns out that, you know, Europe just codifies standards and regulations way too quickly, which eliminate or minimize or get in the way of innovation. And so I'm all for standards. I love standards. Standards are everywhere. The standards of your, of your keyboard layout, the standard of your wall socket, the standard of the power coming out of the lights, the standards of the road rules, they are essential. But standards at the very beginning, nascent stages of things, is it's hard for these major companies to digest. And, and, I, and I grew to appreciate that in a way that I didn't in my earlier career. I agree. I think what will happen is that what usually happens with innovators is that the first one innovates really well, and then all the rest steal it, and then it turns into a standard. So my expectation is from Claude and from the other AIs that are out there from Gemini as well, is that they will have a certain version of their own structured outputs, and then everybody will conform to one good solution here. But right now, the fact that developers have different experiences with different AIs, I'm just saying talking to developers, it sucks. We used to call those de facto standards, right? So exactly. these de facto standards emerge because some group of leaders adopt them, and then everyone starts to kind of copy and fall in line. It's not codified by some standards body. It just becomes the way of the rules of the road, the implicit rules of the road. Now, that's the good news for OpenAI this week. The bad news is executives keep leaving. And, and not just executives, like co-founders and high-profile executives in charge of important things. Yeah. Uh, John Schulman has departed, a co-founder of OpenAI, and he led post-training for ChatGPT and the API. And he went to some small length to mention in his departure tweet that he's not leaving because of a lack of support for alignment research at OpenAI, which has been the narrative, but he is joining Anthropic <laughs> on their alignment team, um, which, you know, it's it's hilarious, you know, yeah. and, and I'd love to get your take on this. I've got some thoughts, but what, what do you reckon about this, Amir? He's definitely leaving because of alignment problems. <laughs> <laughs> And I think he is seeing that there is a big problem with alignment. I think the company is driving like crazy to reach things that are not alignment. That's not their top goal. And, and like as a product person, you, you look at what people do, not what people say. And what you see is that top execs that really care about alignment are moving to companies that really care about alignment. He's a founder. And that's major money for him to leave a company like that. So I think this is a bold statement from him and from the attrition in general that you see in OpenAI. Look, I've been, and I'm sure, Amir, you've had a taste of this as well. I've been in companies where these narratives start to emerge and everything that happens starts to be placed inside the narrative, right? So at Uber, we had this thing that I call the year of hell, where every single piece of news was placed in the context of Uber is bad, their culture is bad, Travis is bad. Things that I thought were innocuous or um, were even counter the, to that narrative were somehow placed in that narrative or dismissed as, uh, oh, they, they don't really know what they're talking about. That's just, a, that's not real. I don't, we don't believe that, especially Kara Swisher love to do that. And so I'm always conscious of playing into these narratives, playing into these, you know, mainstream stories. The reality is this may be true. There may be just some giant alignment issue happening at OpenAI. Everybody's leaving. You know, Sam is really uh, a bull in a china shop, etc. This may all be true. What might also be true is some other things, like maybe there's an, a, more of an alignment issue with equity value, right? OpenAI has capped equity growth. They have a weird structure where it's hard to raise capital. It's hard to get the full value of your shares and your creative growth. So there might be not a misalignment with the AI, but a misalignment with the commercial interests of these co-founders around equity. Yeah. There might also be a misalignment around their salary and their just hard cash payments, right? Because if I move as a co-founder to some other company, maybe you'll pay me two or three or five times the amount of money because I'm one of the co-founders of OpenAI. And so both in the growth of the equity, which is capped, as I understand it at OpenAI, and the pure amount of equity and salary you might get by moving may be a whole different story. There may be a misalignment with Microsoft. It might be like, hey, I don't want to work for fucking Microsoft. They basically, they basically own our asses, right? There might be a misalignment with style. There might be like, you know, 
These are founders. He said he was hired straight out of internship, right? And he knows how to build things and run around and, you know, throw things at the wall. And maybe now it's becoming more bureaucratic with OKRs and budgets and schedules. And he wants to go to, you know, smaller company. I once heard the founders describe it as I build trains. I don't run trains, right? Yeah. So look, I'm just speculating. What I am saying is, you know, I really want our show to be more nuanced about these headlines and that it's not necessarily what everyone's talking about all the time. He may just join the alignment team over there because he's good at alignment. He's done alignment. He understands alignment and getting someone from OpenAI on alignment is a very valuable signal to the market. Anthropic's willing to pay whatever it takes to get that signal. It could be maybe as simple as that. So some of the stuff that you said definitely resonates. I think that I've seen founders that get tired when you move to bigger business. Every mm. time you grow your business by an order of magnitude, you need different skills. You move from innovating to more of streamlining. So I think it could be that he's just tired and he wants to move to another company. I'm just saying, if this was a narrative and we were to believe in the narrative, the entire narrative of Tropics is around they care a lot about alignment and stealing someone from OpenAI, a founder, to work on their alignment is a very good story from them. So even if I don't, like, I, I love OpenAI. I think that they're driving a lot of business and, I, and some of my best friends are there and I they've hired amazing people. But I'm saying it's good on, on Tropics that are really hiring amazing people to work on AI alignment. So not just on the losing end, but also on the re on the receiving end of this deal, this is a very big news. That's a really good point. We should talk about the upside here. So Anthropic, say what you will about the narrative, as you said, they're using the narrative and they're collecting tokens and they're investing in this stuff and they're winning the story. You know, good on them. And they're building a really stellar team. And it's also worth pointing out, I also love OpenAI. I actually like Sam Altman a lot. I like the team there. A lot of it is actually ex-Twitter and ex-Uber people. So both of our alma maters. But it's uh, it has to be said often that the first mover doesn't always win in tech and almost never wins, actually. Yep. Vizikelk was beaten by Excel, right? Lyft and Sidecar, and shout out to Jahan, who's my friend who created Sidecar, was beaten by Travis. We were talking about this over drinks the other night. He's like, yeah, Travis beat my ass. And then I went for work for Uber. And so there's just, you know, Yahoo and Alta Vista were beaten by Google, right? Yep. This first mover advantage almost never applies in tech, actually. But what tends to happen is first to scale or first to network effect wins. Even the iPhone wasn't the first smartphone. You know, yep. kids forget this today, right? And so um, Anthropic is really well positioned. They have none of the organizational debt they have none of the Microsoft kind of partnership and relational debt. They have none of the reputation debt. They're in a good position to make some things happen. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm looking forward to that. All right. Topic number two, something near and dear to my pocketbook, <laughs> Samir, is uh, crypto and tech. Uh, tech stocks especially have gone through a massive correction over the last, I don't know, call it week, call it month. Yep. Huge, huge. Every, you know, I used to wake up every morning and NVIDIA was up again and again and again, another 5%, another 10%, and it is now down again and again and again. And so it's it's painful. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm having a little cry every morning. And crypto, some of the altcoins have gone down 20, 50%. Bitcoin itself is back down to 50,000 from 60, 69,000. There's been a, a serious course correction. There's some of the stock channels I, I follow are saying, hey, we've just sliced through support after support after support. It's not clear that this, these trend lines are going to hold. We'll see what happens. It is worth pointing out, though, as a matter of setting the story up, Reddit's just reported, you know, Q2 revenues up 54% year over year. Uber's Q2 revenue is up 16% year over year. The numbers are not bad, but there's weird signaling from the Fed and from other places around uh, possible recessions. There's a you know, recession indicator that's flipped. And then finally, Kamala Harris indicated some lukewarmness about crypto when she's rising in the polls. And so crypto people are worried about that versus Trump. I don't know. So what do you make about this, Samir? Is this all uh, fear and, and FUD? Is this just a temporary blip and a bit of fear, uncertainty and doubt? Or is this the beginning of a massive correction and collapse? I'm, this is not, we're not giving uh, financial advice. Let's start with that. <laughs> but please don't sue us. The way I look at it, it's depending on your time horizon. If you look at, for example, VOO, which is the indicator of Fortune 500 uh, Vanguard index fund, it has been 
on the rise and year to date it has generated uh, almost 12%. Okay. So last week it moved from 16% to 12%. That's a decline of 4%. That's a lot. But year to date, they are at 12%. And, and they're like very, very tech heavy. We're not changing the subject of this podcast to be on finance. This is all tech, right? So the Fortune 500 companies are very, very tech heavy. And if you look at 12%, that's crazy. Because if you look at the Fortune 500 for the last 60 years, it had had an 8% on average growth year over year. So already in the middle of the year, we're more than that, more than 8%. We're at 12%. So even if with all the falls, you need to look at what the year in general has generated. And usually, historically, year when you have a president uh, election, then you have a better year after the election. So you could even look at potentially a green end of the year. So I think it's a blip. What really is strange to me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, is that all my crypto friends told me that when the market crashes, crypto will be the savior of the day. But if you look at it, it's actually gold. So if you wanted to mitigate your losses in the market and you didn't believe in tech anymore, then you should probably buy gold and not crypto because it has kept its value a lot more than crypto. Crypto actually fell together with the market. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, you mentioned this is a tech show and not a finance show. Yeah. To be clear for our audience, valuations of large tech companies in the public markets directly affects valuations and fundraising for startups, yeah. right? And so as investors are investing in you at your early stage company, they're thinking about the multiples they can get up the value chain, right? Series A, Series B, Series C, and potentially through acquisition or through exit to IPO. Yes. And so these valuations really matter to startup founders and to VCs. I agree with you. This is probably a blip, although we may live to eat our words in the next couple of episodes. And I think corrections are very healthy, right? You know, there has to be consolidation. There has to be profit taking. There has to be just corrections along the way. The market doesn't just go up and to the right all day long. And so I think this is, this is fine for the, for the most part so far. But what is interesting to me is that the stock market is swinging more wildly than before. And in some cases, more wildly than crypto. A crypto has actually been more steady yep. for me over the last, through the whole, you know, ZERP downturn, end of ZERP downturn thing. Crypto has been more stable for me than my stock market portfolio. And that being said, I'm invested in higher growth risk on, you know, growth stocks and things, but still. Finally, on the point you raised about the crypto narrative of like crypto is safe as a hedge against the stock market, hedge against the economy, hedge against inflation. Look, none of the crypto narratives have held up. It's not a libertarian dream where it's yeah. the government's not involved. That's bullshit. The government's involved. You have to have fiat on ramps and off ramps. We all live in governments. Crypto is not a hedge against governments. It is not a hedge against inflation. Inflation's gone up. Crypto's gone nowhere. It's not a hedge against, you know, recession or the stock market, especially not tech stocks. They move in relatively correlated ways. You know, so all of these things have been proven false. For my money, in my mind, crypto is simply a transition of money and value to digitization. What's the advantage of that? Well, the advantages of that are are all the advantages of much of digitization, decentralization, um, fewer middlemen in the loop, more efficiency, more observability, more programmability, on and on and on. And these things are true to one degree or another with, with Bitcoin and as Bitcoin evolves. So, you know, I just think it's inevitable that we move stores of value and providence to digital space. I mean, it's just, that seems inevitable to me. And uh, that's that's worth something. That's real utility. So it's what's worth something to me. That's what Trump alluded to. He wanted to put the Bitcoin as the underpinning um, currency for uh, for the dollar uh, yesterday. I'm not a macroeconomic geopolitical expert here, and you know, there's all sorts of really interesting connective tissue to the petrodollar and you know the the U.S. military and all this sort of stuff that underpins the dollar, and it's very important. I will say, just in terms of naively, the dollar has been pinned to nothing for a long time since they moved off the gold standard. That is an important fact. I don't know if it's good or bad, you know, it's been helpful or hurtful, but it isn't pinned to anything. It's just fucking made up. It's paper, right? It's yep. backed by the force of the US military. That's yep. what it's backed up by, right? And crypto 
or let me say Bitcoin, is probably one of the few truly scarce things in the universe. Like, period. Because of the algorithm. Because of the algorithm, right? Now, you can make more cryptocurrencies that are not Bitcoin. We will find more gold. And as soon as we have the technology to mine an asteroid, we will find infinity gold. We can even make more land. Uh, Dubai is doing that all the time. People claim you can't, but you can. Short of a human being's lifespan, which is truly scarce, and you know, Bitcoin, there isn't much else scarce, truly scarce in the universe. And so um, I actually think that's a really compelling fact. Should it back the US dollar? Is Trump right or wrong? I have no idea. I'm, I'm not clever enough to know. I'll leave that to the all-in podcast guys to talk about because they, they love Trump and they love, they love economics. <laughs> the good people of Twitter. Yes, exactly. The armchair quarterbacks. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's, that's where we're at. I, you know, I think Amir, you and I agree, this is probably a healthy correction, yep. maybe a bit deeper than that. Over the long term, I'm buying the dip. My time horizon is you know, retirement. I just accumulate. I accumulate crypto. I cr accumulate stocks. I don't sell it partly because I don't have the time to follow it that closely and partly because I don't want to deal with the tax implications of either. And yep. so I just buy, 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 and I just hold. That's it. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, that's not financial advice. That's just telling you what I do. Exactly. I do the same. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Dovetail, Flow Health, and Quora all use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Why aren't you? Get $1,000 off Vanta when you go to vanta.com slash TSP. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash TSP for the Startup Podcast to get $1,000 off. Let's move to our third and final topic today, which is a judge ruling that Google is a monopoly in the U.S. antitrust case. Now, very specifically, it's been ruled as a monopoly in the search and advertising markets, and in particular, in general search services and general search text advertising, and that it has acted as one to maintain its monopoly. So it has acted to maintain that monopoly using monopolistic practices. I'm reading now from The Verge, Google's response was, this decision recognizes that Google offers the best search engine, but concludes that we shouldn't be allowed to make it easily available. As this process continues, we remain focused on making the products that people find helpful and they plan to appeal the result. Of course they do. Amir, what do you make of Google declared as a monopoly specifically, and then this general feeling or momentum towards suing these major tech companies, calling them monopolies, trying to break them up or, or reshape their power in some way? Do you think that's ultimately good or bad for founders in particular who are trying to build startups? So I, I remember, I think it was zero to one where Peter Thiel talked about like your mission as a startup founder is to build a monopoly and then to maintain it. That is a very crude way of looking at it, but it's also somewhat correct. If you look at Google, Google had a monopoly. I don't think it had a monopoly because it killed the competition. It just was so hard to build what they've built. And they had a natural monopoly on data and they had a natural monopoly on compute. And they had the natural monopoly of people they hired, amazing people in search. I think all of that created something that was like the electric company. It's really hard to create a new electric company because it's so expensive and so hard to win in that category. So I think Google is definitely a, a monopoly in search and in ads for search, but it's because everybody loves them and because they're actually freaking useful and you don't want to go to Bing or, or all the rest of the crap because they're not, they're not useful. Is it good? I think it's bad. I think it's bad because I don't think Google has been the type of bully monopoly. And I know I've been at Microsoft when they were going through the monopoly verdicts and being broken down. It really changes a company to the worse. It gives the power to the legal people in the company. And then you move into internal fear, uncertainty, and doubt where everything that you release needs to go through an army of legal people whose sole job it is to not launch anything to protect the asses of the executives. It kills companies, these type of things, because it changes the perception of innovators first to protect your ass by 100 legal people first. And that is, that is toxic to a company. Yeah, this is a real mixed bag. So on the Peter Thiel quote in Zero to One, he was initially talking about becoming a monopoly in a niche, of course. Yeah. Uh, and so you want to do one thing really well. 
But of course, when you do that one thing really well and drive network effects, that monopoly can very quickly grow into other niches. And it's, as we talked about earlier, first to scale, first to network effects wins and wins because of a natural monopoly, a natural exactly. power law. Everything starts to accrue to you, right? What strikes me is the timing of this. The Microsoft antitrust ruling came just as the major platform shift was occurring to the web and to the browser and also to mobile. And that really cut Microsoft's legs out from under them yep. and eliminated or minimized their chances to catch up and keep up with the internet revolution. And Microsoft fell way behind allowing Netscape and others to come in and win. And then to fall behind on the mobile space where they took a long time to get into that game and, and Windows CE ultimately failed to compete against iPhone and things like this. That really, really hurt Microsoft, like massively. It cannot be overstated how much that hurt Microsoft. And it seems to me this is happening again at the same inflection point or similar inflection point for Google. Yep. Just as the web is moving from pages and search to large language models, Google's legs are being cut out from under them. As you, I like what you said, Amir, being the company is going to be handed over to lawyers. They will not be able to ship and iterate and innovate as quickly. And it is going to create a major gap, a major opportunity for Microsoft, for OpenAI, for startup, Anthropic, and for everybody to come in and fill that vacuum. This is a major, major decision and a major implication for the whole ecosystem. Now, is it good for startups? I think it's a mixed bag. On one hand, large tech companies acquiring smaller startups and scale-ups is part of the food chain. So VCs invest early, they invest often, and their hope is that this startup will exit to either an IPO, which is more rare than most people talk about, or more likely they get some meaningful exit to a Google or a Microsoft or an NVIDIA or what have you, an Apple for many, many multiples, because they want to take them off the table and fold them into their thing. You know, Instagram famously sold for a billion dollars for Facebook, and then WhatsApp sold for what, two or three Instagrams. Uh, we used to measure everything in Instagrams back in the day. <laughs> it was like, if it was three billion, it was three Instagrams. Um, and so this is, this is what made, you know, the whole ecosystem work in Web 2.0. It's why people were investing in social apps in the hope that Facebook would buy it, right? And so... As I said, like valuations in the public markets compress valuations or affect valuations in the private markets. Acquisitions and the acquisitiveness of these big companies affects valuations. And if they're not able to acquire because of fear of antitrust law, this is a problem for the ecosystem and the food chain. On the other side, it's good in the sense that it creates space for anthropic and perplexity and open AI to create real competitors to Google search and to find their space in the world, IPO or what have you, and, and to be their own massive you know, behemoth of a tech company in the future. So what do you think about that, Amir? If, if you like look at the pros and cons for startups or like the pros on one side and the pros on the other, where does it net out, do you think? I think it's net positive. I think at the end of the day, there's a lot that you could compete with Google now. I think there's a lot that Google will not compete with you. To your point, there's going to be a lot of fear now inside Google. It's going to be handed out to, to legal people. If you want to get promoted in Google, you will not launch things. You will very slowly change things together with a, an army of legal people. So the, one of the biggest competitors and drivers of money is now being held accountable to some extent, or at least not as competitive as it should be. On the other hand, I'm really worried for all the platforms. I think Google is an amazing developer platform. It has Android, it has cloud, it has a lot of other things where it will stop innovating there. Developers are going to get hurt. So I think if you are competing with Google, this is good news. If you are using Google as a platform, this could be a bad news because your platform is not going to innovate or do crazy stuff in the next few years. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's hard for me to say if it's net good or net bad. I think it changes the landscape. Yep. Uh, maybe it's sufficient to say it changes the landscape. It's not necessary for us to categorize it as good or bad. I think it's a mixed bag. I think it has to change your calculation as a founder and exit through acquisition may be less likely to make one of these major tech companies. So you have to think about how do you punch past that, uh, grow past that to be your own substantive revenue company or, or even IPO. I think it's really interesting. 
I wouldn't want to be bought by Google in the next five years. I don't think. Well, I just. I don't think they will. I, I don't think they'll buy you. Yeah, I don't think they'll have the appetite. Another effect here might be Amir that the best Google people won't be able to handle this kind of bureaucracy, which is you know Google's already pretty bureaucratic, but this additional layer of bureaucracy. And so there might be a bit of an exodus from Google to other startups or to new startups. And so this might yet further fuel the creation of AI companies and, and it'll make it easier to hire maybe, uh, you know, uh, salaries may go down a little bit, supply of great talent may increase a little bit. So yeah, it changes the landscape. And I think as a founder, as an investor, you need to think about that. And also, you know, if you get that question from an investor, like, well, how do you know Google is not going to go do this? Man, Google's not going to go do fucking anything. Google's not going to do that. <laughs> Google, Microsoft, you know, Facebook, they're, they're walking on tender hooks right now. Apple as well. And so I will say one last point. I struggle with this monopoly law stuff. Like, yes, certainly if you're, you know, taking people out the back of the woodshed and, you know, breaking their knees, that's completely un unacceptable. But if you're adding products to a suite, like Office 365 or Google Workspace, you're adding capabilities to search that feel natural or at least connected in some way. You know, as a product manager, as a former tech exec, as an advisor, man, I would do that all, all day long. Of course. And for a regulator to say to me, well, Teams is not related to docs and spreadsheets. It's like, shut the fuck up. Teams is the connective collaborative tissue between these tools. That became the new state of the art in the marketplace. Our customers were demanding it. We built it. And, you know, did we decimate Slack in the process? Yeah, but Slack was a feature and we built it. And, I, you know, I, so I do think cutting these deals that are anti-competitive, that are nefarious, not good. Adding features and products and competing, you know, with your natural advantages like distribution power and so on. Eh, it's all par for the course. So there's a real nuanced uh, conversation to be had there. Yes. And the government doesn't know that nuance. So that's, that's no. the key thing. The government does is completely clueless in the, its ability to make a call here. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we make fun a lot about government bureaucrats. I've seen a lot of tech executives and even free speech advocates and others show a, a surprising lack of nuance about these topics. Again, one of my favorite bugbears is people who blame Mark Zuckerberg for the discourse and in, in pol political discourse. I, I do think Facebook has a role to play, but I, I think it's, I think at least their intent is more ambiguous than, let's say, a Fox News. I think they've made surgical changes to try to highlight misinformation and to point to, to relevant sources. And I just think that conversation is lacking nuance. I think it's unfair to rake Mark Zuckerberg over the coals and not rake Murdoch over the coals for what he does, right? And I, I even see tech executives who lack nuance about some of these topics where there's, there is more nuance. And even tech executives who work at these big companies and understand that there are human beings involved just trying to their best hitting OKRs. But we'll talk about other tech companies as if they're these monoliths who are this homogenous beasts that just act with one, you know, unified will. And so I, I, I really like, again, to give ourselves kudos, I like that we try to tease out some of this more subtlety and nuance. I think that's very important. That's awesome. All right, Amir. Well, we only the two of us today, so it'll be a, a short and sweet one. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. How can people find you on the internet? So I'm Amir Shvat. You can find me on LinkedIn and on Blue Sky under Amir Shvat. Awesome. And you can find me on all the social media at Chris Saad and at my website, chrissaad.com and where you can get my newsletter at chrissaad.com slash newsletter. Thanks everyone for listening and thanks Amir for joining me. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Today's episode of the Startup Podcast was brought to you by Vanta. Vanta automates compliance for SOC 2, ISO 27001 and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies already use Vanta. Why don't you? Get $1,000 off Vanta when you go to vanta.com slash TSP. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash TSP for the Startup Podcast to get $1,000 off.